Now I have a few different 3D printers that I use most of the time. I have three main ones, my Prusa Mark III S, my FL Sun SR, and my FL Sun Q5. They're all, well, one of them's Cartesian, the other two are Deltas. But recently I've swapped out one of them, and the one I've swapped out is the Q5. With this, the Ender 7 from Creality. And I will say that I didn't replace the Q5 because the Q5 was a bad printer. It's still one of my favorites, like beginner printers out there. The only reason that I've swapped it out is because the Q5's build area is only about 200 millimeters in diameter by 200 millimeters tall, where the Ender 7 is a little bigger, 250 by 250 by 300. Also, the Ender 7 is a Cartesian rectilinear core XY 3D printer, which is a new one for me. I've actually never used this style Cartesian printer before. I've only used like the standard um, Ender 3 style Cartesian printer and of course Deltas. But why Core XY? What makes it better if it is than like the Ender 3 style Cartesian printer? Well, there's a few, there's a few advantages such as you get a larger print area for the footprint of the machine. They're relatively stable and they can print relatively fast without leaving behind, you know, artifacts in your prints. And the reason they can do this is because there's no, there's no part moving around with significant mass like there is on like an Ender 3. We got the build plate going back and forth. Remember what Bill Nye told you? Inertia is a property of mass. But to do this, Core XYs use some pretty long and complex belts, relatively speaking, to other Cartesian printers that if not properly aligned or if they're loose, your accuracy is gonna suffer. But that being said, regardless of what the printer you have, if you don't maintain it, you're gonna have a bad time. Another thing about Core XY printers is that they're, if you don't assemble them square, you're also gonna have a bad time. Luckily, the Ender 7 is actually really easy to put together. The top and the bottom come as one piece. You just install the legs and the build plate and you're good to go. However, one thing to look out for when assembling this printer, if you do pick one up, is how tight you make the bolts. If you're like myself, uh, you like to go Hulk smash on your bolts to make sure that they're tight as possible. You don't want those things coming loose. Ever. But the problem with that is, for me, on this left pillar here, this left post, I tightened all these bolts down just as much as I did on this side, but when I started to run the printer, that guide, uh, the linear guide block on that rail, ran into the screw and, yeah, it didn't work. It just kind of made a horrible grinding sound as the belt slipped and yeah, sad sadness ensued until I figured out what the problem was. And that got me thinking. Now, as someone who does d design industrial equipment daily or at my day job, when I see stuff like that, it kind of gets me wondering. I know for a fact that somebody, somebody missed some of their clearancing. You know, you got, you always check for interferences. Somebody missed the boat on that one or they were getting their calling. They're putting things a little too close together. And also I only had it on that side. If I only had it on the left side and not the right side, and this machine is symmetrical, I would assume, that makes me think that there might, there might be some sort of tolerance stack up uh, that went unchecked. But I don't know. Either way, after I backed it off just a hair, made sure it was still tight enough to hold the leg uh, secure, didn't really have a problem. Now as for the printing experience, it was actually pretty impressive. As you can see, I've only printed three benches here. One I just kind of did out of the box. The other one, I kind of messed around with the settings a little bit, and then I kind of messed around a little bit more to get the stringing to go away, and that was it. It's pretty much good to go. I will say that I don't use Creality Slicer. I like to use Prusa Slicer. I'm just used to it, so I just stubbornly stick with that, and Creality has not released an Ender 7 preset for the Prusa Slicer, so if you want the best experience right now, you probably should use their slicer that's set up for this printer, but that being said, all I did was take the, the profile that I used for Mark 3S, pop it over into a new profile for the Ender 7, tweak it just a little bit, and I got a pretty good result. And I'm sure it could be even better once they release their official version, or I spent some more time messing around with it. Now this is a Benchy that was printed at uh, 0.3 layer height, not 0.2, but it looks pretty good. There's no artifacts, it's pretty, pretty decent. Other than the printing experience, other things I really liked is that the touchscreen is very responsive. I've used lots of printers that they're like my Amazon Fireboxes now. You hit a button, you wait about three hours, and then it switches over. But it switches over right as you press the button again, so then it goes twice. This one's actually real, real responsive, real quick, and I really liked it. The build plate is also really nice. I like the finish on top of the glass. I still use a little bit of glue stick because I don't want my prints to move. I'd rather have, I'd rather have them stuck on there just a little too good than have them fall off while I'm trying to print something. Uh, other than that, if I'm being picky, uh, one thing that really bugs me about this printer is it doesn't come with automatic bed leveling, and I think that today, any printer that comes out should come with automatic bed leveling as the default, unless you're talking about like a budget, a budget-oriented 3D printer. 
But this one isn't a budget oriented printer. This is like a, this is a $700 printer. And for a $700 printer, you should get automatic bed leveling standard. Now, if you go into the bed leveling feature, you'll see that there is the stuff necessary to add automatic bed leveling. The board does have it. When I reached out to Creality about, you know, instructions for installing it, they told me that BL Touch is still under development. It's not out yet, but hopefully it will come out soon so I can add it down the line. But again, why can't we just have it? Other than that though, I mean, the whole experience with this printer from putting it together to getting it going was pretty positive. I, I really have nothing bad to say about it. I, I, maybe if I was to pick a little bit more at it, I wish it was a, a direct drive rather than a Bowden setup, but it prints good. It seems well constructed other than that little screw issue that bugged me, but I think it's a good printer. Now that being said, there, there is something I wanna check out about this printer before we get into what I have planned here in a little bit. And that's the bed. I've seen a, lo a lot of uh, concern on the old interwebs that people aren't too happy with how the bed is set up on this printer. You got this big glass sheet um, kind of floating in space on a couple of gussets attached to this back post. And people think that this is gonna, this is gonna flex, and it, it could. I mean, it seems pretty sturdy, but if you get a big large print on there, you're gonna have some droopage in the front, which is, uh, again, gonna translate into having a bad time. So we're gonna try to check out how much, if any, this, this setup droops, uh, and if it should be a concern or not. I haven't had any issues yet, but I've only printed tiny little objects on it, and this is obviously not enough weight to cause you any issues. But let's see if we can uh, do some measuring. So this is the plan. I've moved the printer and the table over to this steel post in my basement because I needed a place to mount my absolute indicator, which I've done, and I'm pointing it at the front side of the bed, and I've got it zeroed out to, well, I just got it zeroed out, it's at zero now and the idea is we're going to jog the table down and up and see if it is one repeatable and then we'll put some prints on it see if it starts to droop so the first thing we're going to do is go down by 10 mils 9.59 not exactly 10 but might be some slack in the system go back up and we ended at zero so it did go down and up the same amount we'll go down and up again 9.59 so it's consistent and we'll go back up and we're at zero so that at least tells me that the table is repeatable up and down. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go down by 20 mil to get off the indicator and then back up just to make sure that we are still good. Zero. And I'm going to go down now 20 and put a print on it and go back up 20 and see if we have any droop in the system. The test print we're going to use is the Picard bus because it's hilarious. Uh, it's reasonably big and, you know, something you might print. So now we're going to put that right kind of on the middle where you'd print it gonna go up 10, up 20, and it's at zero, so we're not really drooping at all. Let's go back down. Let's move it closer to the edge, where you can still see the dial, hopefully. Back up 10, back up 20, still at zero. But let's try worst case scenario. Let's go down 10 and 20, and let's say you printed something massive, and you used an entire roll of filament. I'll try to get this on here somewhere towards the front side center. You might have something printing, make sure it's not touching anything. And we're gonna go up 10, 20, and we're at 0.33. So we're drooping a tiny bit, but not that much. Let's take this off, see if it goes back to zero, which it does. We'll go back down to 20. We'll try to get it even closer to the edge. Hopefully you guys can still see the indicator. I don't wanna to touch any other part of the printer. Looks good. So up 10, up 20. 0.36, so pretty much the same thing. Take it off, we're back to zero. So an entire roll of filament means that the front of this bed is gonna droop about 0.36. Not ideal, but doesn't seem like much. So for a bit of comparison, I have set up my Neptune 2 from Elegoo, which is actually a pretty good printer if you, can, if you can find one. But the reason I chose this one is it doesn't have automatic bed leveling. It's got the same adjustable spring screws. And I just wanna see if this one moves at all and if it does, how much just so we get an idea of if the Ender 7 is a lot, a little. Let's see. 0 0.17. 0 0.2. So not as much, but this one does move as well. So I'm glad we took the time to run that little test because I know there's a lot of concern out there that the design that Creality has chosen for the Ender 7 is a big fail because the build plate's going to droop a bunch when you put a big print on it. And I mean, we put an entire spool on there, which would be a, a pretty massive print. And we only saw a max deflection of 0.36 compared to 0.2 on the Neptune 2, 
they're pretty close. I mean, I did also test the Prusa Mark III S. That one does not have adjustable springs on the bottom, so it only deflected like 0 0.03 or 0.05 at the most. What also might point to the fact that the springs are what's deflecting and not really the entire structure that the build plate sits on. Now I do, I do wish that Creality would have chosen to use linear guides on the Z-axis like they did on the X and Y, but they didn't. They use those little V-caster wheels, whatever they're called. But if that was a concern you had, I, I don't really see it as a huge deal. I haven't had any issues printing on this one thus far. Now if that does change and I start to notice issues, I'll let you guys know, but doesn't really seem like a huge concern, at least to me at this current moment. But what we need to do now is find something interesting to print on the old Ender 7. Now we can print more benchies, they're always fun, but we have this. This is the Creality CR Scan 01, and it is a 3D scanner that lets you, well, you can do a little turntable setup where you can put like a cup like this on a scanner table and scan it and print the cup, or you can even do it handheld. And the idea that I, I wanna do Somebody actually even commented this, is we're gonna try to scan Cooper. Now the problem we might run into is this, this has a flashy light, like it's basically a camera, it takes a bunch of pictures and stitches them together. But I have a feeling that this flashy light is gonna make Cooper excited. And for this thing to work properly, you gotta stay put, because I've scanned myself, and you gotta not move if you want it to track right. And Cooper's not really good at not moving. But we're gonna, we're gonna try it. I don't know how we're gonna do it. But we're gonna try to scan the dog. And if we can do it, I'm gonna, I'll put it out there so you guys can print out Cooper for yourself. Okay, this is not gonna be easy, but I've set up his natural habitat. This is the downstairs, my old downstairs basement couch. And right here is where he loves to be. So we're gonna try to get him to stay there. Hopefully he'll eventually like settle down enough that I can sneak up on him. Scan him real quick. So let's first get him. Cooper! Come on, come here. There you go, your favorite spot. There you go. So this is where we're gonna try to keep him. You're a good boy, you're a good boy. Do you want your picture taken a whole bunch and then we'll print you out? I bet you do. I really expected that to be a lot harder than it was, especially because I've used one of these handheld type scanners in the past. Not this specific one, but a different brand. And it was very, it did a very poor job at like maintaining the target. Uh, so bad, actually, I just sent it back to the vendor and didn't even make a video on it. But this thing is rock solid, even when I was scanning the dog here on the couch. Uh, if I moved off the target and then back on it, it immediately picked the points back up and continued on. The only issue I really had is that every now and then he'd be like, ah, Ah, uh, my leg itches, and he'd move his head, and then I'd have a head on the armrest and a head back by his back legs. So there was one time that he fell asleep while I was scanning him, and I got a good 4,000 pictures of him. And I've uploaded that model to Thingiverse, so you guys can download it, uh, pop it into Mex Mixer or whatever you guys use to hopefully clean it up. Because that's one thing I did notice. After I scanned him, uh, I brought the model into Mesh Mixer, and I don't really know how to use that software well, and I had a tough time trying to clean it up to a point where I could print it. So I'm hoping maybe you guys can help me out. Clean up that model of old Cooper and we can print it out maybe in the future. But yeah, this thing is great. I'm really excited to see what other opportunities it unlocks for the channel. I haven't had any issues with the Ender 7. I'll leave links to both these things in the description below if you want. And Cooper, you're the best. Thanks for staying still for the most part. And uh, we'll see you next time.